next session is going to be the inherited arrhythmia syndrome, which is on 26th of April 2022. Super. So we're going to hand over to um, uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, uh, Dr. Tevik Ishmael, who's a consultant cardiologist at St Thomas's and a senior lecturer at King's College London. Tevik's a fond of all knowledge and he'll be talking to us about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thanks very much, Tevik. OK, I just started trying to uh, uh, get my screen share working. I hope that's OK. Uh, can you see can you see my screen? We can yeah. see a blank um, Apple screen, no slide yet. OK, uh, you see the slides now? No. Uh, OK, um, I think there is an issue with the permissions. Uh, so sorry about this. If you'd like, I can load your slides for you and if and can advance them if you just let me know when. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why, why, don't, why don't we do that? That'd be easier because uh, I don't normally use a Mac and it's um it's got such level of security. It won't actually let me you, you see the screen. Super. Thanks, Andrea. That's brilliant. OK, that's good. Right. So um, my name is Stephen Gisbert. I'm one of the consultant cardiologists here at Guy's and St Thomas's. And I'm going to be talking to you about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, some people spend literally their entire careers studying and uh, looking after that one disease. So trying to sum, sum up the knowledge that comes from that in 15 minutes is a bit of a tall order, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I want to cover basically what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is. I want to tell you a bit about the epidemiology because that's important to be aware of in terms of thinking about um, how likely is someone in front of you in clinic actually has the condition. Obviously, we're not going to do an ICC session without talking a little bit about genetics. I want to focus on the clinical features and then the kind of complications that you might expect to see in clinic and what kind of management issues that tend to come up. And then finally, I want to talk to you about the outlook for this condition from a sort of from prognosis point of view, because that's relevant in terms of talking to patients. I'm not going to focus hugely on left ventricular outflow tract obstruction because that will be covered by a talk actually in the session uh, following. And then obviously there'll be a, a few minutes hopefully with some questions. So next slide. So HCM is an inherited cardiac condition and it's defined by left ventricular hypertrophy in the absence of a cardiac systemic or a metabolic cause that can account for the degree of hypertrophy that's actually present. So that actually allows the possibility of dual pathology, i.e. hypertension. You, you've got to bear in mind that about one in three of the population will have high blood pressure. So it's not uncommon or unheard of scenario to have uh, both conditions. So the question is, is the hypertrophy you're seeing in the patient in front of you out of proportion to what one would expect of their degree or chronicity of hypertension? Um, similarly with other metabolic phenotypes, such as you know, type 2 diabetes, along with hypertension as well, is what we're seeing expected or within the spectrum of what one would expect? Um, there are also conditions that can mimic HCM, what we call phenocopies, or, or the Americans like to call HCM spectrum disorders, things like um, ATTR amyloidosis that doesn't actually cause hypertrophy but thickening of the left ventricle, um, things like Friedrich's ataxia, uh, Fabry's, um, Danon, Prakka 2, and then there are you know, various other amounts as you can see in the RAS or MAP kinase pathways. Um, you know, so-called rasopathies and a number of other you know, rare regina types that can look like HCM, but actually are not um, what we would regard as sort of sarcomeric or sarcomere associated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and probably have a different natural history and certainly have different management pathways and treatments. So that they should be sort of considered separate diseases, really. So in terms of imaging, we make a diagnosis of the wall thickness of 15 millimetres above if there's an affected first degree uh, in the absence of a first degree relative. But if there's an affected first degree relative, you have to you know, lower your bar because the pretest probability is 50 percent. And anything you know, um, 13 millimetres or above would count. Obviously, in children, you need to normalise that for, you know, uh, for, for their age and uh, body size with, with a Z score. So a Z score 2.5 or above uh, in the absence of family history or 2.0 if there is a family history. There's a particular type of HCM that tends to cause thickening of the apex. And that, that requires really different criteria because often you can get wall thicknesses less than 15 millimetres, but where, where the patient has a very clear phenotype, what we look for in that situation is, a, is relative hypertrophy. In other words, the, hyper, the apex is 
thicker than the, the, the base in comparison, because as a normal heart, the heart would taper down in wall thickness as you get towards the apex. So if the wall thickness of the apex is greater than that at the base, that's asymmetrical hypertrophy of the apex relative to the base, and that would, in association with the appropriate family history or an ECG, be enough to sustain the diagnosis. So next slide. So in terms of epidemiology, HCM is seen in all populations. It's not confined to one particular ethnic group or race. Men and women, as you'd expect for an autosomal disorder, are affected equally. But the reality is, when you look at all, all studies, men are found in excess relative to women, probably because they're more likely to be diagnosed. We know that women tend to be older and more symptomatic when they're diagnosed. And this reflects probably inequalities in the way uh, women have access to healthcare and, and to an extent the degree with how seriously they're taken by their physicians and their access to, to cardiac screening. A man is more likely to be diagnosed with high blood pressure or another cardiac problem and have, be offered an ECG in the first place. Uh, so that's something to, I think to bear in mind and hopefully some these inequalities will, will get ironed out in, you know, in the future. Um, about one in 500 of the population have some sort of unexplained hypertrophy, but only a fraction of these ever become um, symptomatic and ever diagnosed. But the true prevalence could be as high as one in uh, 200 uh, if you look carefully enough. So I think the other thing to appreciate is HCM is not a single disease, but it's actually a group of different diseases with similar or overlapping clinical features. And that's even within sarcomeric HCM as opposed to the phenocopies that I've already talked about that are genuinely separate diseases that have different management pathways, such as Fabry's, for example. You can it can present at any age from, you know, um, even in the neonatal period, it's recognised all the way through to a very old age. Uh, next slide. So the majority of patients where, when we look for a faulty gene, we find something in the sarcomere, that's roughly 60% of patients with a, a clear phenotype. And there are various different sarcomere or sarcomere associated genes that, that can go wrong. But the bulk of patients tend to have a problem in either in myosin heavy chain, beta myosin heavy chain 7, or in myosin binding protein C3. Variants in all the other genes, troponin I, troponin T, alpha tropomyosin, etc., each make up between 1 to 5 percent uh, of all cases of genetically diagnosed um, HCN, depending on which series you look at. It is also so more dominant that penetrance is quite variable. That's to say that the disease can come on at variable ages and can be of vary, varying severities even within the same family. And sometimes you can get what we call pleiotropy as well, so the same gene can actually give you completely different phenotypes, um, particularly some of the more thin filament um, uh, diseases tend to, tend to you know, can present with a restrictive uh, phenotype rather than you know, pure hypertrophy or you can get a mixture of the two. Um, so next slide. Most patients, um, if you look at most sort of epidemiological series, actually are asymptomatic at diagnosis. Um, the ones that we see in the ter in tertiary centres, of course, are a subset of that, and they, they do tend to be more symptomatic. That's how they come to medical attention. But a lot of patients are picked up through either screening or um, they, they fall over, they break their, you know, their leg, need, need open reduction for their fracture and, and have any 12 DDCG because they're over 40, and that's how it's you know, picked up and diagnosed. In terms of symptoms patients get, they, they tend to be the full schemes of what we see in cardiology. So chest pain is very, very common. And that may be due to microvascular dysfunction, which is actually a key feature of the condition. It can be due to outflow tract obstruction, which places an increased afterload on the ventricle. And in concert with um, microvascular dysfunction, ischemia uh, can make the patient quite symptomatic. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is patients with HCM can get coronary disease. So it's important not to miss epicardial coronary disease in these patients as well, not just label it all as microvascular angina, uh, because now having comorbid coronary disease vastly worsens your outcome. Exertional dyspnea is obviously a very common problem as well, and that can be related to diastolic dysfunction, outflow tract obstruction. With outflow tract obstruction, you can get mitral regurgitation if there's SAM or other mitral valve abnormalities. So HCM can often be a disease of the mitral valve as well as of the muscle, and you'll hopefully hear a bit more about that in the talks now, play tract obstruction. AF is a, is a you know, not uncommon problem that affects anywhere between a fifth or up to half of patients, depending on which series you, you look at at some point in life. And then a small subset, uh, but significant subset, do actually get systolic heart failure as well, which I'll talk about a bit later on. So obviously fatigue can be an issue with all of this. But the medications we tend to use, um, particularly beta blockers, can make, make this worse as well as the disease itself. Um, another symptom to look at is exertional, uh, look out for is exertional presyncope, and that often can go along with outflow tract obstruction. 
Pre-sync can be associated with arrhythmia or rest can be an important you know, marker of increased risk and something else that we all ask patients about when, when, when we see them. Palpitations are very common. They can range from anything from minor ectopy all the way through to non-sustained VT and either proxysma or sustained atrial fibrillation uh, or, or even worse. The next slide. So outflow tract obstruction is fairly common. We see it in about a third of patients at rest. But often it's a question about how hard you look for it. And um, you know, we, can, we can find it in up to two thirds of patients on provocation, either with exercise or exercise echo. Um, so if you do suspect exertional symptoms, it's certainly important to, to, to look, look for um, a latent gradient. That should be done with exercise, not with dobutamine, because it's possible to induce an outflow tract gradient in a healthy heart using dobutamine if you try hard enough. Um, I've done it various times in my career. Um, heart failure is an important and increasingly important clinical problem. Um, HCM used to always be about sudden cardiac death, but now that sudden cardiac death has essentially been you know, addressed very well by you know, better risk stratification and ICDs, we're seeing more and more patients survive to an age where heart failure becomes an issue. And most patients get a degree of diastolic dysfunction. Um, you can see obviously heart failure in association with outflow tract obstruction. But instead of a fraction of anywhere between five and eight percent of patients actually develop systolic heart failure. And for HCM, where the ventricle is hypertrophied, the LV cavity tends to be small and the ventricle tends to be dynamic in function. We define an injection fraction of less than 50 percent as significant LV impairment. So that would be analogous to an EF of 35 percent in so someone without HCM essentially. So if you see someone with an injection fraction of 45, 50 percent in HCM, that patient is in trouble. And uh, should be regarded as such and treated as an yeah, increased risk. AF is, a, is again a common issue, and at least one in five patients at some point in life will experience atrial fibrillation, an instance of roughly 3%. And then obviously that can be associated with stroke and thromboembolism. The rates can vary from low, low below 1% all the way through to 1% or higher as you get into older age groups. Um, and obviously, yeah, yeah, one or two percent may not seem high for a 70 year old if you look at their background risk of stroke but for a 35 or 40 year old spread over their lifetime is quite significant the other thing we do um, occasionally see in a subset of patients particularly younger patients is cardiovascular dysautonomia in other words abnormal heart rate recovery with exercise and sometimes inappropriate vasodilatation and that that certainly in younger patients might be a soft marker of elevated cardiovascular risk um, it's kind of fallen out of favour in terms of contemporary risk stratification, but it's certainly something we see from a symptom point of view every now and again. Next slide. So what do we do when we see these patients in, in, in clinic clinically? Well, you're not, not going to be surprised to you know, hear me say that you need to take a full history, uh, but including a detailed occupational social history. Uh, it's really important to find out what the patient does for a living, because that might impact on their activity levels and their ability to adapt to their work. Um, clinical examination is obviously very, very important looking at other evidence of an outplay track gradient, but also features clinically that might point towards a, a spectrum disorder or a uh, venous copy of HCM. For example, um, you know, uh, angiokeratoma in, in, in uh, sorry, um, uh, skin lesions in Fabry's disease, um, etc. Again, all patients need a three generation uh, pedigree uh, 12 lead ECG is a key part of making a diagnosis and often you'll see abnormalities on the ECG years before you see anything on imaging. Um, less than 5% of patients have a normal ECG at presentation. Mainstay of diagnosis um, still is echocardiography, but if you're suspecting apical HCM from an ECG uh, or if someone's got poor windows, then MRI might be considered a first line diagnosis diagnostic modality in that setting. It's particularly good at visualising areas like the lateral wall, which are you know, harder to image on, on echo. Um, a baseline MRI is very, very helpful in all patients so that you know where you are to begin with, uh, but obviously that will vary with your access to scanning services. In terms of bloods, we tend to order a full spectrum of bloods, so full blood count, obviously looking for things like anemia, which might exacerbate breathlessness or symptoms. Clotting, a baseline clotting is very valuable because um, inevitably at some point you'll get a 24 hour tape that will come through saying new onset AF then of course if you haven't got a baseline clotting with which to then confidently prescribe a DOAC or warfarin. Uh, renal profile goes without saying, um, LFTs again very helpful. 
um, yeah, to, to, to be aware of in terms of you know, affecting drug prescribing for various indications. CK to look for, again, phenocopies, which may be associated with skeletal muscle abnormalities like glycogen storage diseases. Um, lipids and HbA1c are really important because these patients already have a cardiac problem and they find what you don't want to do is let them develop coronary artery disease or type 2 diabetes. And we know that type 2 diabetes can also worsen outcomes in this cohort. So it's important to pick up, diagnose and treat and hopefully prevent. Thyroid functions are important because amiodarone is a drug that we commonly have to prescribe for this group. And so it's reasonable screening to test to do with anyone at once a baseline at one point in life. Um, anywhere between three and six percent of patients actually have um, Fabry's disease and this is something that can be treated with enzyme replacement therapy. So in men we offer an alpha galactosidase assay. For female carriers who can be affected this is often unreliable so if you do suspect it you need to rely on genetics for diagnosis. I tend to do a troponin C and NT pro BMP to see where our baseline and particularly if the patient has a troponin leak without symptoms that's important to be aware of. So if they then become symptomatic or develop an acute coronary syndrome in future, you know what your baseline troponin is. And if they get chest pain, that perhaps is slightly atypical, people then don't overreact to a very slight troponin rise that might actually be their baseline uh, troponin level. We always store DNA uh, with consent for consideration of genetic testing, but only after appropriate genetic counseling. And then, um, uh, an exercise stress echo can be helpful if uh, we discussed already if you suspect an outflow tract gradient you can't reveal with Valsalva. All patients get at least a whole to monitor uh, to screen for arrhythmia, that's non-sustained VT that might impact on risk stratification or atrial fibrillation. If someone has risk factors for AF though, that could be their age, history of sleep apnea, dilated left atrium, significant mitral regurgitation, then obviously a seven day take can be, it can be really helpful for picking that up. Uh, again, if they've got risk factors, think about a sleep study because that can be a potent trigger for arrhythmia uh, in, in anyone, but particularly in, in this group of patients. And if they're over 40 and they've got chest pain, it's important to, to think about the coronaries and take them out of the equation. And anatomical testing with CT is quite helpful because often patients will have microvascular ischemia with other modalities that might be difficult to just differentiate from epicardial coronary disease. So I have a low threshold for doing this and then offering statins if you find anything abnormal more for prevention, but that's kind of slightly off piece or outside of the guidelines at the moment. If the patient does have you know, significant gradient and you're thinking about surgery at some point, but obviously you need to evaluate that and the mitral valve in detail with a TOE. And if the patient's MYHA class three or four and you're thinking about the need for transplant referral, then obviously a CPAC can be quite helpful, but often that'll be done by your transplant center. Uh, next slide. So in terms of management, the key priorities are um, risk stratification. So in other words, working out what their risk of sudden cardiac death is. So this is something that we all fear instinctively and, and you know, we're absolutely right to be mindful and careful of it. But the annual instance is probably about 1% or slightly less than 1% if you look at you know, community-based cohorts. Initially, when this condition was first described you know, with large tertiary centre cohorts, the, the mortality appeared significantly or vastly higher because patients were only very, very symptomatic where we're getting referred and they tended to be a higher risk cohorts. So the, the, the risk of sudden cardiac death is perhaps exaggerated in the earlier literature, but it is nonetheless a significant and devastating complication where it to occur. It's important to diagnose and treat outflow tract uh, obstruction because it affects a lot of patients. It's a big driver of symptoms, but it can also potentially be a big driver of, of adverse outcomes and progression to things like atrial fibrillation and symptomatic heart failure. And the, you'll hear a bit more about that in the next sessions, but the main safe treatments are negative inotropes, that's a beta blocker or a calcium channel antagonist, a yeah, non dihydropyridine calcium channel antagonist such as verapamil. Uh, and then we added disapyramide as a negative inotrope if that's not sufficient to achieve uh, symptom relief provided their QT interval is reasonable at baseline and it doesn't prolong too much uh, with the diazepiramide, you usually can get away with that. Very occasionally we have to combine beta blockers with verapamil, but obviously that's a combination we would only use in someone who's pace or very, very rarely we do occasionally initiate that combination in patients in an inpatient setting. So obviously it's not ideal starting a, a verapamil and a, bit, and a big dose of beta blocker. There are emerging therapies that are targeted at the sarcomere that have negative inotropic properties that may um, offer you know, further options for patients in the near future. And for those who fail medical therapy who are still um, symptomatic with you know, at least class three or four symptoms, there's gradient reduction surgery um, 
usually the treatment of choice. Or if the patient's not a candidate for surgery, then alcohol sepsis ablation. But you'll hear a bit more about that later on uh, today. We've already talked a bit about AF. It's important to diagnose it and treat it. And treatment like, is no different uh, from any other uh, type of AF in terms of priorities or anticoagulation and then either rhythm or rate control. The difference, however, is that the CHADS2 VAS scoring system really does not apply to this cohort. Their risk of st stroke is, is probably vastly higher than your standard AF patients. So regardless of their CHADS VAS score, we have a low threshold for offering anticoagulation in the absence of any bleeding contraindications. I personally take a very aggressive approach to atrial fibrillation because it's often a cause of marked deterioration clinically. So I favor aggressive rhythm control you know, pharmacologically in the first instance, and then I have again a low threshold if the patient has indication for this and suitable anatomy, um, AF ablation. Otherwise, you're stuck with um, with rate control. Uh, it's important to diagnose and treat any systolic heart failure and then refer early for consideration of transplantation, even if the EF is only just below 50%, because that's the harbinger of increased risk. Because remember, in HCM, Often the ventricle is dynamic. The end, end systolic, uh, end diastolic uh, volume is, is low because of the hypertrophy. So it doesn't take much of a change uh, you know, in terms of contractions to generate injection fraction, 65, 70% for these patients. So an EF of less than 50% really is quite low. Um, but again, you'll hear more about the appropriateness of referral for transplantation for ICC patients later on this afternoon. Obviously, as with any ICC, it's important to, to screen first degree relatives. And then consider diagnostic genetic testing. This is usually indicated for most patients, but obviously if the patient has no relatives or is unkeen on testing for their personal circumstances, it's not something that's you know, necessary. You, know, you, know, you can offer all patients. It may not change your immediate management, but it can be helpful if you're in a position to then offer um, predictive testing to first degree relatives. And having a sarcomere mutation as opposed to having a, what, what we increasingly regard as non-sarcomeric or more polygenic uh, HCM probably puts you in a worse prognostic group and may, may raise your antenna in terms of follow-up. So it does change management, but of course, genetic testing takes time and it can often take six months or more uh, to get results back. So uh, it's important, but not as important as, um, you know, as uh, all the other basic steps. And some of the audiences have already highlighted that patients may, for very good reasons, not want to get tested. It's absolutely fine and that's legitimate. So all patients should be offered the opportunity of testing, but only after at least a thorough, careful genetic counselling. And then after, after test results are available, post-test counselling to help interpret them and deal with the findings. All patients should be provided advice on exercise and depending on their um, yeah, occupation and, and their lifestyle driving. And then yeah, depending on your age and um, other circumstances, um, advice on the um, family planning and uh, re reproductive counselling if relevant. Uh, so next slide. Tavik, we're coming near the end of your time. Yeah, so. yeah. fantastic. Um, so um, I just want to uh, wrap up quickly by talking about risk stratification. So there is uniform agreement that if someone's had a cardiac arrest uh, or has sustained VT that they get an ICD. Uh, but for primary prevention, there's slightly different approaches between the US and ESC guidelines. The ESC guidelines use a risk calculator that estimates five year risk. If that's less than 4% ICD is not indicated, if it's above 6% ICD should be considered. And there's a kind of gray zone area in between where there's a kind of discussion about the pros and cons of the patients. And it's, you know, we usually offer it, but it's not necessarily a compelling indication. The US approach uh, focuses more on single risk factors but requires exercise of really more clinical judgment and experience, um, which arguably makes it less suitable for general application outside of um, an experienced center or unit. Um, the ESC model also doesn't take into account some factors such as impaired ejection fracture falls outside of that model, or the impact, for example, of radiant reduction surgery, or, or young people in general. And even the validity for the age, age 16 to 18 is difficult because only 2% of the cohort uh, in the derivation cohort were in that range. Probably the true answer is to use a hybrid of the US and the uh, European models and to mer yeah, merge them because the risk factors for sudden cardiac death have changed over time. And that's not reflecting um, true changes in the biology of the disease, it's simply reflecting the study of different cohorts with you know, increasingly better um, uh, statistical techniques. So next slide. Um, so this is just a summary of the ESE um, algorithm. And as you can see, the equation at the bottom, there's not something going to be at the top of your head. Um, you need a calculator for that, which is available to download free. And then the US approach, uh, the next slide, um, 
uh, is yeah, much more based on individual um, risk factors. Uh, but they caveat that, for example, non-sustained VT is in there, but they, they caveat that with a, a four beat run of non-sustained VT might have less significance than, say, a 20 beat run of non-sustained VT. So there's a little bit more nuance and um, clinical judgment call for an exercise in this. And the problem with each of these individual risk factors is they on their own have low positive predictive value. Um, so, for example, massive LVH defines a wall fix of more than 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, 30 millimeters, um, but actually very few patients are in that category. So yeah, you can debate how helpful that is and whether someone with a wall fix of 28 millimeters actually is lower risk. Um, so the ESE calculator has the advantage it takes some of these factors into account, but then doesn't take others into account. So I personally use a, a mixture of the two, reflects that the evidence is not secure, but significantly better than, than where we were 20 years ago. And the data bears, bears out that outcomes have improved. So um, next slide. So you know, the lifestyle advice, we used to um, uh, be quite strict with this, but we now advise that um, there's no restrictions for anyone who's genotype positive, but asymptomatic or phenotype negative. High intensity competitive sports might be considered in low risk patients mm -hmm. after specialist mm -hmm. evaluation. Um, competitive athletes should be seen in a dedicated clinic and low or moderate intensity exercise might be actually, is actually could be fine for, for those who are low risk, which are outlined there. And the next slide. Um, I've just outlined here some guidelines for family screening. Um, these, these will probably change over time, but there's a reasonable gambit there based on sort of risk. Uh, and, and also, if there is a known mutation in the family, that might influence your decision of timing. Um, and then finally, I just think it's important to highlight that most patients diagnosed in adult life can expect a normal life expectancy. And those certainly diagnosed over the age of 60 years have a prognosis similar to their peers. Obviously, paediatric or early onset diseases associated with higher risk. There's a 1% roughly annual risk of sudden cardiac death, but obviously that'll be higher in some people. 5 to 8% of patients will develop systolic heart failure. It's important to be aware of. And the thing that you might catch you about is the wall thickness may thin out over time with that. Uh, but roughly a fifth of patients get some sort of heart failure symptoms. But overall in the HCM cohort, only about 0.55% per annum actually progress to heart failure or death and 0.07% rising to 1% in older age to experience stroke. So actually, um, it's possible to manage these patients and get very good outcomes, such as a message I want to get across. Um, so it just um, uh, any any questions there? Apologies, I've overrun and I had problems with my slides again, but um, I hope that was a reasonable summary. And obviously, the, all the information is there in the slides, which you'll have access to after the session. Thank you very much, Tavik. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll probably save the questions to the panel discussion just a little bit later on. There yeah, have been yeah. some um, within the chat that we'll um, address with you at the at the panel discussion. OK, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much. So just if, not, 